and he is holy. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to see you this morning. A little nippy cool air when you wake up this morning. You know, the old flesh wants to pull the blankets up, doesn't it? Well, I'm glad you pushed them aside and got up for the glory of the Lord's day. It's a great way to start the week. Some people still think that Sunday's the weekend, but we know it's the week beginning. And that's why we commit it to the Lord. And we call Sunday fun day around here. I don't know about you, but uh, we get excited at my house Sunday's coming. Praise the Lord. I get to speak without being interrupted usually. So. No, she's not in here. Okay, so. <laughs> That was a joke, okay? <laughs> Chill out. But it is good to see you. We're doing a series of messages called Sync. And that's to do with synchronizing our life with God and getting everything on the same page with Him. And so often I think that uh, many people's lives are so out of sync that they wonder, where's God? What's going on in their life? Why isn't God doing this? And they have a lot of questions. And it all gets back to the fact of being on the same page with, with the Lord in your life. I do believe that God's plan for our life is detailed. I believe it's purposeful. I believe he's got something for us, and I believe each day that God has something for our lives, and we don't want to miss that. And so we certainly need, as a common vernacular today, this terminology is very popular. So we have all these electronics of getting everything in sync. We certainly need to get our lives in sync with the Lord Jesus Christ. We've talked about the definition of what it means to get in, uh, in order with, to move, to operate, to work at the same rate, the same time, everything working exactly together. Now that's the, the dictionary definition of the word. And looking at that particular word and looking at our, the word of God and saying, well, what does that mean in regard to us as Christians? I can't think of any better way to live your life than to synchronize your life with the Father. That you're moving at the same pace. You're, you're in tune with him. You're hearing from God. You're, you're walking according to the will of God for your life. I love the passage in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 where it says that we're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's not of works lest any man should boast. But verse 10 is that great passage where it talks about that we are recreated, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. In other words, God's got a plan for your life. And the way you discover that is to get in sync with the Lord. So this series of messages has been doing with that. The, the first message was getting the right connection. You, if you don't know Christ and you don't know life, you're going to have to get right with God. The second one was a staying in sync with the Lord and getting the latest updates. Well, that had to do with grieving the Holy Spirit or listening to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's ministry is to make us more like Jesus and to transform us daily into the image of Christ. His ministry is to exalt Jesus as the Lord of every area of our life so that Christ is truly being magnified in our life. And that's what that part two was about. Part three was last week about getting all our applications in life updated. We talked specifically in regard to relationships and marriage, how that we have to discover first and foremost that no other relationship is going to really be in sync in our life until we're in sync with our relationship with our Heavenly Father and we realize that really there's no one person that can meet all the needs of your life. Only God can meet the needs of your life. Only God can meet the deepest needs of your life. And if you think for some moment in time or your husband or your wife's going to meet all your needs, you're going to live a frustrated life. We talked about the importance of realizing first and foremost that what we need is Jesus plus nothing. Jesus and that brings everything. Amen? Now, we talked about that application of marriage. We're going to talk about another application in regard to our finances and being in sync with our finances. This is version 1.0 for those who don't have the latest, all right? But with this version and understanding, this is the first version. This is from the scripture. This is what God has to say about our finances and what God has to say about giving. And I know that uh, some of you probably think I preach on giving all the time. But if you want to know the truth, I preach on giving two and maybe three times a year. Out of all the hundred and something sermons I will preach in a year, only two or three sermons will be about this. And sometimes I feel a little backslidden because if you study the scripture, just in the New King James Bible concordance alone, there's 277 verses on faith and belief. There's 340 verses on prayer. There's 518 verses on love. Let's double that up to 1,439 verses on giving. I think the Lord's trying to tell us something. Amen. I think there's important lessons that we need to learn. And maybe in proportion of everything the Lord said, maybe we should look at even a little bit closer. If you look through the scriptures and what Jesus said, and you'd see what he had to say about our relationship to things and the relationship to the material world, do you realize that over half of the parables that Jesus preached on dealt with stewardship 
management, faithfulness in what God's placed in our hands, learning how to do with the things that God gives us in a proper way, that one out of every six verses in the books of Matthew and Mark and Luke, one out of every six verses in those books have to do with the issue of money and stewardship. In fact, Jesus spoke more about it than he did about hell or heaven. He had a lot to say in Scripture. I read a recent statistic that said over 56% of the divorces in our country usually get down to the problem of couples fighting over this issue of money and finances. And truthfully known, if most people get honest, they'll see that they really don't manage their finances, they end up managing them. The Bible has a lot to say. In fact, there's two chapters in 2 Corinthians that deal specifically, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, where Paul is speaking to the church. And those two whole chapters just deal with this issue of what we do with money, how we deal with it, our attitude, our relationship to money and, and what God has for us. I remember hearing the story about a missionary who was speaking about the needs of uh, the foreign mission fields and how that they were reaching the heathen and reaching the pagan and how money was needed. And uh, there was a man sitting next to the aisle about halfway up and they began to take an offering for the missionary for his ministry that was out there. And uh, he had his arms folded and sat there with a you know, that grim scowl and look on his face and he obviously didn't want to be there, and he certainly didn't want to hear about the mission field. Just didn't especially want to hear about the offering and giving anything. You know, maybe his wife made him come. I don't know. But anyway, he's, he's all mad, and the usher comes by with the plate and hands it down to him, and he just sits there with his arms folded, and uh, the usher says, you know, uh, uh, this is time to give. It's, it's just, hey, sir, you need to understand, I, I, I don't give. I, when my wife was sick, I didn't give to her and help her. When my, when my kids needed money and they needed some extra help with school funds, I didn't give to them. When my sister was ill and needed a doctor visit, I didn't pay for that. I don't give. He said, but sir, it's for missions. He said, I don't believe in missions. He said, well, then why don't you take something out because it's for the heathen anyway. <laughs> Amen. And I think we really understand what the Bible has to say and what Scripture has to say about Scripture. I think, I mean, about these gift verses on giving, it should transform our life. And I really believe the Bible has so much to say about it, and Jesus spoke so much about it because it's important. Evangelist Bill Stafford has been with us on many occasions, and I remember him saying one time, he says, you know, why do we have all these verses about, you know, uh, giving instead of heaven or hell? Why did Jesus speak so much about it? And the response was that he gave, was that, well, he knew it wouldn't take that much to get us out of hell, but it would take a lot more to get hell out of us. Amen. And I really do believe, especially in America, in the Western Hemisphere, we are so materialistic and so uh, fundamentally locked into, you know, having stuff and having things so that things really do have a tendency to take over. They have a tendency to manage our life, and we really miss it. There's two bottom lines in all the, the principles about stewardship and about giving and about finances. That are, If you look and boil it down to two things, there's, these are the two most important lessons of it. One you need to understand is that God, you know, he owns everything. Let me say it again. God owns everything. That means your car. That means your house. No, no, I built that house or I own that car. Uh, no, God owns it. You say, well, I bought it from the, the dealership, didn't own it. Amen. In fact, everything that car made of it is came from God. Everything your house is made. It's like me going out to McCoy Lumber or, or to Home Depot or something like that and each night sneaking in and stealing the supplies that I would need to build a house. And I go out and I, I, one night I get all the lumber for the, the, you know, for the walls and the ceilings and the roof line. And the next day I steal the roofing materials and the floors and the carpets and, until I finally have everything for a house and I build it. And then one day they discover I stole everything. Home Depot comes up or Lowe's or whoever and says, that's our house. But that's my house. I built it. But you took everything that wasn't yours to build it with. You need to understand that God owns everything. He lets us use it. He lets us use it. So he owns everything. There's not one thing in your house that God cannot look at and say, oh, that's not mine. Everything in the universe, God can look at and say, mine. Mine. And I'm going to let you use it. I'm going to give you some of it. Well, you do what you're supposed to do with it. You manage it right. You handle it right. But I, that's, that was the creation account in the garden. God created the earth. He created Adam and Eve, created man, created the universe. Everything was there. And God says, mine. And then he turns to Adam and says, take care of it. Manage it well. 
Whatever I put in your hands, you be faithful to do with it what you're supposed to do. You manage it properly. So the first thing is this, God owns everything. And the second principle following that is that, is that hey, he's called us to take care of it. He's called you and I to manage it properly, to handle it properly. How do we know how to handle it? Well, I'm so glad you asked because that's what we'll talk about today. It, we handle it according to what the Bible has to say. Not one thing I'm going to tell you, not one of these scriptures that we're going to talk about, you know, has my name on it. God wrote these verses. And even though it says KJV maybe on it, it doesn't mean King Joe version. <laughs> All right? The NASB doesn't mean the New Arm Standard Bible. All right? This is God's Word, and we need to really get serious about what God says and say, well, am I operating my life according to what God has to say? Am I doing what the Lord has, has for me in my life? One thing we discover about God is He does own everything. He has given it. God is a giver. In fact, the Bible tells us one of the most obviously famous scriptures of all times, John 3, 16. For God so loved, He gave. For God so loved, He gave. God is a giver. You see it from Genesis 1 all the way to the end. God gave His Son. God gave us life. God gave us redemption. God gives forgiveness. And then God meets our needs. My God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God owns it, and then God puts it in our hands to manage it, and we have an awesome responsibility to do what we're supposed to do with it. He is a giver. Never are we more like Jesus than we are giving and we become givers, and we're not selfish, and we're not stingy. We're not always holding it to ourselves, but we learn to be just like God is. God is a giver. He's given to us, and now he wants me to be like him. How can I tell if I'm becoming more like Christ? Well, I believe one of the obvious ways is I'm not stingy, and I'm not selfish. In fact, I become generous. I care about people. I care about needs. I care about things. In fact, I care about God, and that's why I am giving. In fact, as you read the scriptures, Paul has to say this, that we discover that Jesus is really not interested so much in how we give. He'll direct us in that. But even more important than, I mean, than what we give is how we give. God wants to know, yes, we give, but what is motivating us to give? What is it that, that promotes you? Why do you give? Really, I don't want to ask that question first and foremost. Not how much you give, but why do you give? And I believe that when you understand what the Bible has to say, he is going to say a lot about attitudes and a lot about the importance of a right attitude and a righteous attitude when we choose to be givers. So the first principle, mine, says God. Second principle, yours to be in charge of, but it all belongs to me. There are three biblical reasons that we're going to talk about today, and this is the outline. I'll give it to you, and then we'll go over each one of these points of why we're to give. One, it's to be a response for what God has done for me in the past. It's a response for what the Lord has done for me in the past. The second thing we'll talk about is, is to be a response for what God is doing for me right now, in the present, and how that my giving determines so much of what God is doing for me in the present. And the third is to be a response for what God will do for me in the future. What's out there? What my expectations should be? And how is my giving going to relate to that and in, to what regard? Because those are the important elements we'll talk about. So it's a responsibility. It's an important responsibility. Why do we give? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 are some verses that we'll look at today. And as we go through these, we'll see very clearly. Because those are classic passages on us in the New Testament as believers, as Christians, how we respond to our, to our Lord in this case. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 8, 7, Just as you excel in everything else, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and your love for us, so you also excel in this grace of giving. He says, listen, I, I, I praise the Lord that you're excelling in your, in your faith, in your love for Christ. And, and you're, you're learning how that what comes out of your mouth is important. That what you say and how you say what you say is important. That out of your heart, your mouth speaks, all right? So you're ex praise the Lord that what you're saying and what's coming out of your mouth, it's edification, it's encouraging. Praise the Lord that you're excelling in that. And you, you're learning, the word, you're excelling in knowledge, and that's exciting. We want to be that kind of church that's always going deeper and excelling in the knowledge of the Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He said, and you're excelling in your earnestness. You're, you're, you're sincere. You're excited about Christ and about each other and about the will of God and about the word of God. Praise the Lord that you, you, you're this complete earnestness that you have and that you love us. I praise the Lord that. He said, but hey, I want you all not to leave out this important issue. You need to excel, which means to go over the norm, above and beyond. 
You need to excel in this particular, and I love it because it's a grace. This grace of giving. Learn to excel in the grace of giving. Now, I know there, there's a lot of emphasis put on excelling in these particular areas we have up in the, in the scriptures there that you can excel in kindness and earnestness and speech and, and knowledge and all those things and a lot of emphasis in the church today. But sometimes we forget to emphasize this important grace of giving that we learn, we need to learn to excel. You say, well, I'm, I'm learning my earnestness. I really want to be what God wants me to be. There's this earnestness in my heart. And, and praise the Lord, that's there. But hey, you need to learn to excel in some other areas. And this particular he's talking about to these people in Scripture, and I believe to us today, he wants us to grow in our giving as well. Not to be stagnant, not to be selfish, not to be stingy, not to be stuck somewhere. He wants us to live in a growing relationship in regards to our finances. I, I love what R.G. Letourneau, J.C. Penney, some of those great businessmen who were strong believers in Christ in the past, both of those men had made statements in their life that they wanted to come to the place in their life where 100% of everything that they received, that instead of 10% of that going to the Lord, it's tithe and keeping 90%. They wanted to come to the place in their life where they gave 90% and kept the 10% to live on. And both those men achieved that in their life. That's where they came to. That's excelling in the grace of giving. A lot of us have become content with the little we give or the, maybe we've learned to give more. Maybe we've kind of been given the same thing forever and maybe we give a tithe and you've been stuck in that 10% for, for as long as you've been saved. There's never been this point where you've wanted to grow in the grace of giving. Well, the first point I said I want us to learn is that giving allows us to express appreciation for the past blessings. Uh, and the, in the passage that he uses here in 2 Corinthians, he says, you know, each, each man must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or out of compulsion. In other words, saying you shouldn't give because you're pressured or because you feel guilty. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. Now, really, let's get honest. Why do we give? I think the heartbeat. I think the, the genuine motivation for real biblical New Testament giving as a believer is based upon the fact we realize all that God has done for us. We say God owns everything kind of trily, but we know he owns everything. And we begin to realize that. And we get, we get to this point of humility, and we get to the point of, uh, of, of, uh, of understanding that everything I have comes from God. That God has blessed me. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, the scripture says. That God has blessed me. And, and I'm not just talking about now. I mean, God blessed me this week and God blessed me this month and praise the Lord, he's going he's to bless me this year. But I want you to realize that 2,000 plus years ago when God sent his son, God gave to me the greatest blessing that I could ever expect from anything or anyone or any place. God sent his son and God let his son put aside the riches of glory and he became a human, this basis of creatures. Oh, not as low as the animal life, the scripture says, but lower obviously than those heavenly beings. God, God became a man. God became like you and me. He sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And he became a man. And he lived out of, out of mercy and out of compassion, a perfect sinless life for this reason. One, because he's God. But secondary, so that he could offer himself as a sacrifice for our sin. Us offering a sacrifice for our sin, well, the Bible says, so wages of sin is death. So if I offer the sacrifice for my sin and I die, that's over. There's no life. It's judgment throughout eternity. But he comes, he takes my place. He dies on the cross. The wages of sin is death. He dies for me. He pays the price for my sin. And not only so, he goes willingly. He goes humbly. He's beaten. He's maligned. He's pushed, he's shoved, he's beaten with, with whips, he's crowned with thorns, his nails are driven through his flesh. I mean, the spears run through his side. He dies like a common thief and criminal. For me. For me. He did that for me. That's everything. Everything on the altar. Everything just for you. Everything just for me. There certainly ought to be something in my being that says, thank you, God. Thank you, God. You did that for me. I believe that's the motivation ultimately for all our giving. God, you've given me so much. How can I say thanks for all the things you've done for me? 
Now, obviously, one of the ways that we can do it in a very practical sense is expressed, he says here, that we become cheerful givers. Why are we so cheerful? Why are we excited about it? We're excited about it because we, we're partnering with God. We're fellowshipping with our Father. We're showing appreciation. We're showing gratitude. We're showing love. Thank you, God, for loving me in such a way. I can love you because you first loved me, and I can give to you because you first gave to me. So the number one reason any of us really genuinely give should never be out of, well, it's the preacher preached about giving. It should always be, God, you loved me, you gave you, you, I didn't deserve a thing. I deserve to die and be judged and go to hell, but you loved me and you gave me your grace and you gave me your mercy. The scripture says there in 2 Corinthians 8, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. He became poor. He had everything, he owns everything but he laid it all aside so that you can have a full and complete, a meaningful, significant, purposeful life. And we say from that, thank you, Lord Jesus, for that kind of grace, that though you had everything, you gave up everything just for me. That becomes the motive, that becomes the heartbeat. The verse there, right before that, in verse, nine, verse eight, he says, for, you know, I'm not commanding you. I, I'm not commanding you. But I do want you to test the, 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 the sincerity of your love. And, and you know what he's talking about in this passage? In the context of this verse, he's talking about the giving. Prove your love. If you really love God, put your money where your mouth is. I mean, that's the common vernacular we'd use today for this same thing. Put your money where your heart is. If your heart says you love God, then, love, then, then show it. I mean, it's one thing for us to sit around and sing, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul rejoice, but I'm not going to put my hand in my pocket <laughs> and give you a single dime. Oh, my soul rejoice. You see, if I really do love God, it's not a big deal. If I'm really serious about Christ, it's just not a big deal. That I, that I would do this because, hey, God says our giving proves our love. I, I love God, then I want to show it. I mean, I'm willing to, to, to trust him to the point that I, I'm willing to give him what's, what's there. I'm not going to pick through my life and just give him the leftovers, you know. Isn't that what so many people do? Yeah, I ran across this little piece of poetry here recently. It says, you know, leftovers are such humble things. We wouldn't serve to a guest. Yet we serve them to our Lord who deserves the very best. We give to him leftover time, stray minutes here and there. Leftover cash we give to him, such few coins as we can spare. We give our youth into the world to hatred, lust, and strife. Ah, then in declining years, we give to him the remnant of our life. I'm going to do what I want to do with my life. When I get old, I get it right with God. I want to do what I want to get with my money. When I get out, I finish spending what I want to spend, then I might give something left over to God. You know, there's just no appreciation in leftovers. And God doesn't want the leftovers. God wants you to give the best unto him and to honor him. So the way we do that is if we, we take time to really value what Christ has done for us. When's the last time you just took some time to meditate on all that God has done for you? When's the last time you really took time to think, God, you gave everything for me. When's the last time you just closed your eyes and, and meditated on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ? And in your heart's eyes and mind, you saw him bearing that cross through that crowded street up to that skull hill and lay down his life voluntarily. And out of that came a brokenness and an appreciation and a satisfaction and a fullness of love. It says, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I had no hope if you had not done this for me. And we can do that, then the giving of our life, that becomes kind of an issue that's mute anymore. We just want to serve the Lord, and we want to express our love to God. So there is this, that we realize that giving is an appreciation for what God has done for me. The second thing, giving allows me to examine the motivation in the present. It helps me to look beyond myself. It helps me to look beyond my own needs. I mean, we bec we, we're a very uh, self-entitled kind of generation and world that we live in. We think the world owes us something. Our parents owe us something. People owe us something. You know, we deserve this. And, you know, you de listen, we don't deserve anything. We are selfish, 
We are self-centered. We are mean-spirited. We are hateful. When left to ourselves, all that's important is really us. But when we look out of ourselves and look to God, that's what humbles us. And we realize that even though we were like that, God sat down and showed his mercy and grace. But here's what happens in my present life. Now that I've appreciated him, God allows his part and says so much about it, this issue of giving and stewardship and finances, because it really does help me to evaluate myself and to evaluate my own motives. It keeps me from being a selfish person. The greatest way to overcome covetousness and greed and materialism, breaking that bondage of selfishness in your life, is to break free and learn how to be a giver in your life. Learn how to be a generous person in your life. There's not one person who's famous who's given something. They don't get famous for what they keep. <laughs> You're famous for what you've given, whether it's your life or sacrifices, finances, missions. The famous, they're famous and they're respected by people because of the generous heart they had. You want to be known. You want to be appreciated. You want to be welcomed. That's not the reason you do it, obviously. But hey, out of a heart that's humble before God comes this kind of ge generosity. And I want you to know, when the Bible talks about making gifts unto the Lord, and it talks about giving proportionally, and it talks about giving regularly and weekly, then that comes to the place that each week I get a chance to examine my motives. What's important to me? Who's first in my life? What's going to be the most important thing in my life? What about the kingdom of God? Or is it all about the kingdom of Joe? What's really important? I love what Deuteronomy 13, 14, 23 says, the, the purpose of tithing is to put God first. That's what it's all about. There's two things that God established, obviously, in the garden when you begin to study Scripture. One was that the first day of the week belongs to the Lord. The second was is that we should offer an offering unto the Lord. You say, how do you know that? Because Adam and Eve taught it to their sons. That's how they knew to bring offerings. All the way, this is before the law, folks. This thing about proportional giving and offerings is long before the tithing commandments. People look at tithing and proportional giving. Oh, that's just the Old Testament stuff. I don't want to do that. Now, you don't want to do it because it's Old Testament. You don't want to do it because you're stingy. I mean, let's get honest, all right, all right. He, he, don't get mad at me. Remember, this all comes from the Bible. <laughs> we just, we just, we get selfish. I don't want to get selfish. If that's the only reason you don't give, you think that's going to wash with, with the Father when you have to stand before him and give account of everything he gave to you and what you did with it? I don't think so. The, the proportional giving long predates the law of Moses. Remember, you got all this Genesis stuff with, with Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Noah and all those things and Abraham long before you ever get to the law. In fact, the Bible says that Abraham tithed long before you ever get to this commandment. In fact, if you want to follow the Levitical tithing, you'll probably end up giving about 33 and a third percent. That's what it kind of breaks down to if you want to go that route. But I think there's, now the New Testament obviously talks about everything belongs to the Lord and we do give out of that. But we have this standard that the Lord's given us with this, with this 10% thing. It's, it's obviously a, a starting point. 10%. If I have a dollar, how much is 10%? 10 cents. How much? 10 cents. 10 cents. I got a dollar. Let's lay it out in dimes. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. And the Lord says, honor me and prove the sincerity of your love and if you give me a portion of that, 10 cents. I can't even buy a piece of gum with 10 cents. Can't even get a parking spot for 10 cents. I'm certainly not going to get a cup of coffee at Starbucks for 10 cents. <laughs> a dime. A dime on the dollar. You're making a fuss about a dime on a dollar? You, you would gripe and try to argue Bible verses about a dime? 10 cents on a dollar? 10 pennies? 10, 10 cents on, on, on one dollar? That's not a lot of money, is it? No. Well, Brother Joe, you know when you got a thousand dollars. Well, maybe we just need to pray you make a dollar. <laughs> It won't be a big deal then, right? <laughs> we, just, we just get so wrapped up in, in the materialistic world we live in. And so God's trying to get us to the point where we just, what are my motives really? Yeah. What, what, and I need to take the time to examine what my motives are. That's why the Bible says, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God take care of the rest. The food, the clothing, shelter, all that. And, and Matthew 6 deals with that. God, but you have to honor God first. 
You honor God first with your substance, with the first fruits. The Bible talks about the first, the flocks. Why does it talk about those things? Long before it gets to tithe. Because it's a way to say, hey, you know, God, I do realize that everything I have comes from you. And I just want to be honorable. And I want to recognize you in this way. And I just want to commit myself to you. I want to express my gratitude to you. And I want to honor you and show and prove to the, to the world, to myself, and keep my motives in check. In fact, eight, five of that passage in 1 Corinthians reads that they did not do as we expected. They gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us, keeping with God's will. He's talking about the Macedonians here. He went to take an offering of this poor, poor church in Macedonia for the poor, poor, poor church in Jerusalem. All right? And he's taking this offering. And he says, you know what blew me? And he's writing to the Corinthians about it. He says, I, I, I went down to the Macedonian church down there. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, I talked about giving to the, the needs of the, the saints here under persecution at, in Jerusalem. And those people went crazy. They just started giving like, they were poor. And they did more than, in fact, they said they first made a commitment to God. We're going to honor God in everything we do. And then they said, you tell us what to do. You're the leaders. You're the directors here. What, what are we, what's expected? So they gave themselves to the, to the will of God and to us. And it says, and their giving overflowed out of that to the needs of many. Well, that's what happens when we do give. A lot of needs get met. We're purposefully participating in what God's doing. They gave themselves, they gave their lives, they gave their hearts completely to the Lord God to honor Him. And when they gave their offering, they gave it to help. They gave it to, to, to be generous to other people. So here, that's the priority. God, God's saying to us, don't worry about giving me your money if I don't have your life, first and foremost, because I don't need money. We give not because God needs it, Really, if we're talking about the second point here, about motivation, we give it because we need to give it, because of what it does to us, because it keeps us from being stingy, because it keeps us from being self-centered, because it makes us look above and beyond and outside ourselves to those who are hurting. So number one, we give to express appreciation of everything God's done for us and hadn't he done so much. We also give to examine our motivations in the present. Luke 16 tells us very clearly that, hey, if, if you're not faithful with money, you know, God's not going to trust to you the true riches. That's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? If you won't be faithful with, with, with mammon, he calls it, with, with money, with greenbacks, God's not going to give you the, the true things. It's amazing when you study Scripture and you talk about finances and these issues and stewardship, how that stewardship and spirituality are linked so much together. That's why the Bible has so much to say about it. Why? Because it really proves if we're materialistic or not. It's one thing to say amen in the sermon that we ought to give and then not give. All right? And there's a lot of people do that. They'll sit here and they'll agree with every word I'm saying. Amen, amen, amen. But they don't give. You know, they just don't. Or if they do give, it's certainly below what would be acceptable to God the Father and what kind of standards he's given us and what kind of proportions he showed us. Because for whatever reason, some people think they need it more than, than, than they need to give it. Some people think that if they won't make it without it, or that, what are we going to do? God, it just shows you're not really looking to God. Then yes. yes. I'm not really trusting the Lord. What he's saying in Deuteronomy is to teach you to put God first. That's what it does. Me second, others before me, not a, you know, and God before everything else. And that's really what stewardship really all, all boils down to. I, I don't know about you, but I really hope that in your heart, we all would say the same. I want the true riches. I want the best things that God has for me. I want everything that the Lord has for me. I don't want to be bound up by covetous, listen, materialism and greed. What's more important? And I think sometimes we lose the value of what's really important in the present life. We think that what's more important is having more and getting more. It, it, it's like I, I was hearing a preacher on 88.3, that, that station out of Conroe this morning on the, on the way to the other campus, and he was, he was talking about a man who was a, a, a very popular night come singer in, 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 uh, in Las Vegas, and his wife was a dancer, and one night in a hotel room, they were there getting ready for go to do their shows or whatever, and uh, she'd been reading a Gideon Bible there, and she slid it across the bed, and she says, you know what, I've been reading this, you need to read this. And he opened it up. They began to read the scriptures. And they ended up both giving their life to Jesus Christ as a result of that. 
got out of that world. He surrendered the ministry, became a great man of God. But he was telling the story about, because the man was, this man who'd gotten saved, that was the singer, had gotten saved and was on an airplane going to, to share his, his life and his testimony with someone. And while he was there, the Lord impressed him to talk to the stewardess that was on the plane. And as they were talking, he says, you know, well, what, what, are your, what are your plans? I mean, what's, what's, your, what's your deal? What are your plans? He says, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm very young right now and I'm, I'm doing college part-time and working, trying to work my way through college as, as a stewardess. But, you know, my plans are, well, I'd like to, you know, finish college. He says, then what? Well, I'd like to get married. Then what? Well, I'd like to have a family. You know, after, after doing my career for a while and get married and have family, it's great. Then what? Well, you know, see my kids off to college and see that they get started right in life and, you know, they're going all right. Well, then what? Well, maybe we'll buy a boat. Okay. Then what? Well, I, I guess, you know, we'll retire at grandkids. Then what? Well, I guess we'll die. Then what? <laughs> Important question. Because every one of us are going to get to that then what? Then we're all going to die. And all the toys and the boats and the houses and the retirement, all those things won't matter a hill of beans. Nothing. It's not going to matter. It's irrelevant. You're not going to take it with you. There's, there's no U-Hauls behind the hearse. You've heard that before, right? You know, uh, they may stuff all your money in the coffin with you, but it's staying in the ground. All right. Then what? What's, what are the important things of our life? God is the most important thing. The true riches of heaven are the most important. Planning uh, uh, an investment in eternity, that's what's important in our life. The then what's, uh, no, no matter a lot. It's not what kind of car you drive right now. And some of you may have that in your mind. If I just had this car, you know, and, and, and you think if you had that little car with the circles on the front, you know, that, that you've got multiple circles. If I had that car that was on TV, I, I could be happy. Oh, there's that one with a circle and some lines going through it. Boy, if I had that car, I'd really be good. And, and oh boy, if you drive that car with the circle and with the H going sideways, you're poor, you ain't got nothing going on. But if you have the H going straight up and down, that, that, that H car, well, you're in a lot better shape and you'll be happier than that, that slanted H. And we sit there and we watch it on the TV day in and day out and believe it. We believe it. And it doesn't make us any happier. And it doesn't make us any more significant. And it doesn't bring any more peace you know, and I'm not saying not to have, God blesses us with lots of stuff. And God blesses us with more stuff than we need, but there's got to come some time in our life we say, okay, enough stuff. What about the kingdom? <laughs> enough things. What's important? What's important is my kids, my grandkids, my great kids, grandkids. I may never see, I want, them, I want them to know the truth. I want an investment in eternity. Things that will matter, things that are important for years to come. I want, to, I want my life to mean something. I want people to be able to go and look at my tombstone in the cemetery and it says, he gave You know, he gave, he was generous, he cared. It wasn't all about him, it wasn't about what she could get, he could get, they could get. There are more important things in life than just what we can get. True riches. But giving also, the third point, allows us to enlarge our expectation of the future. It's not only appreciating for what God's done for me in the past, it's not only checks and keeps my motivations in check for what's important in the, in the present, that God's first in my life and I can honor him in my life, but also there's this important part of giving that so many people never understand. It really is a demonstration of my faith in God. I don't have a problem giving to God because I'm not worried about my needs being met. Why? Because I have a promise from God that he'll meet my needs. All right? God said, seek you first the kingdom of God, all these things, it is righteousness. Hey, I'll take care of the rest. Is that a lie or is it the truth? I believe it's the truth. Don't you? Don't you really? I mean, we, we can say that, but, but we ought not say it if we're not givers, if we're not seeking first the kingdom, if we're not good stewards of everything that God places in our hands, if we're living like thieves, then we certainly can't say, oh, well, God's going to meet all my needs. Well, you're too busy trying to meet your own. Allow God to meet your needs. And there's no, there, there's no, uh, there's no place where you, you want to see God do something. I don't know. I, I think probably one lesson in, in the context of all those verses we showed from the Bible a while ago on giving in relation to heaven and hell and stuff, I would probably say that most of my conversations in the, in the latter teens with my children to present day in regard to what I taught them the most, one thing I wanted them to learn more than any other thing, obviously heaven and hell, you want to get that straight out first, amen. But after that, I want them to learn how to be generous. And over and over, I've drilled and continued to drill my kids who are 
20 and 30 now, all right? Drill them. Be a giver. Be a giver. Be a giver. See what God can do in your life. Give God the opportunity to do something miraculous. You'll see God move. It's a demonstration that you really are putting your trust in Him. So if God tells me to give something that I might think sacrificial, I can give something, even if it is sacrificial, in this material world, because it's not with Him, because He promises to do back to me whatever I've given. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, But this I say, He which sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, but he that gives bountifully and sows bountifully, he shall reap bountifully. What does that mean? That means if you get your little cup measures out of your kitchen drawer and you give a teaspoon's worth to the Lord, he'll give you some teaspoons back. If you give a cup full of the Lord, he's going to give you some cupfuls back. If you give a shovel full of the Lord, he's going to give you some shovelfuls back. That's what it's saying. I didn't write that, all right? It doesn't say 2 Corinthians 9, 9, I, Joe, the apostle sent by God to the Corinthian church. <laughs> It says, Paul, an apostle, sent by God. It's a message from God to the church. It's relevant, it's living, it's for today. Be a giver, but don't be a little giver. Be a big giver. That's what the Bible say. In fact, he said, you know, determine in your heart. Decide how you want to get it back. You want to get it back a little, you give a little. If you want to get back a lot, give a lot. I don't know about you folks, but I'd rather get back a lot than get back a little. I remember when Kathy was uh, secretary for a Baptist church years ago, I was in evangelism back in those days, and she was doing secretary work at this little church near where we lived. And I remember going by to pick her up one day, and I'm sitting there talking to the church treasurer. And as we spoke, he began to tell me how difficult things were financially at the church, and how they were just barely getting by, and what they were going to do, they'd made a decision, they were going to, you know, cut all their mission giving way back. And I just basically, you know, I thought, that's pretty stupid. You know, I've always been real choice and selective with my words which usually gets me in trouble. I said, that's not the right thing to do. I said, you ought to increase your mission giving. Bump it up a little bit. What? Because the Bible says if you give, that God will give back to you. Well, I just think that's just, that's just selfish. Selfish? For me to be obedient to God's word is selfish? For me to believe what God said is selfish? I'm not, I'm not asking God to give back to me just so I can have. I want God to give back to me so I can have, so I can give some more. So God can use me. And the more that, that he gives me, the more I can give back to him. And said, so what God wants you to do is, is to, to make a statement of faith, of expectation, of genuine belief. And the way you do that is you give. I don't know how I many of you might have a little, little stash. Anybody have a little mad money? I have a little place. Don't tell anybody in the back of my wallet. I keep a few extra dollars. We call that mad money. You know, in case you go mad sometime and you need... Spend something on something you just really don't need. But usually what Kathy and I do with our mad money is, I, I save it for vacation stuff, you know. You know I, mean? I like to scuba dive, so I put back some mad money. But as I get closer to vacation, like my mad money, there's not enough for scuba diving there. I start giving out of that mad money. And every time, God always gives me enough to do my scuba diving. All right? It's just mad, isn't it? <laughs> just makes no sense. All right? And sometimes I'll give out of that case. Did you give some of your mad money? I said, yeah, I sure did. God told me to do it. She said, well, here, let me give you some of that. Said, no, 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 no. You, you want to try to give me something and then God's not going to give it to me? God gives better than you give. <laughs> and she'll do the same thing. She'll go off some money. And she's, I said, did you give some money? She said, well, I just, the Lord told me to do that. I, just felt, Lord, I said, well, you know, why don't you just take that out of the check? No, 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 no. I want God to do something. And that's the lesson we want to teach our children. We ought to catalog. We ought to somehow keep a diary of what God does for us and as a response to him. That I, I just believe God's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we think or ask. I believe given it shall be given to you, pressed down, shaken together. I mean, that's what the scripture teaches us, that God will do exceedingly abundantly above. In fact, the Bible says, just bring what you're supposed to to the house of God. All right? And then the Lord says like this, and then test me in this. The only place in the Bible where God says testing. Some of you are real good at testing God in other areas. <laughs> we can all be real good at testing God in the wrong areas, amen? But there's one permission, one place in Scripture God says, try me. Test me. Prove me. I'll guarantee you that if you'll do what you're supposed to do, I'll open up the windows of heaven and I'll rebuke Satan off your life. I wonder how much Satan gets from us because we don't tithe or we don't give. 
How many times has that car broken down because we weren't giving what we are supposed to give? How many times have we had something we shouldn't have had because we weren't obedient in some area of our life? How many times has it just seemed like there's a constant leak in our finances because the only way to plug it is by doing what God said to do? And we won't do it. As I left the other campus this morning, one of the men came up to me and says, you know, last year, he said, there were some needs that came up in my family. Instead of just meeting the needs and trusting God, I cut my giving back. And he says, I haven't recovered yet. He said, thank you, because that's exactly what I need to hear today. I see what the problem's been. It's been me, not the situation out there. Because there's always a situation. There's always something. There's always some demand. But the way that we're always ready for whatever the demand is, is learn to be faithful in what God has given us and to be trustworthy in what God's given us. Give and it will be given to you. I didn't write it. Who wrote it? Jesus spoke these. They're in red letter in your Bible. Give and it will be given to you. I, they will pour into your lap. He said, men, I'll cause people to give money to you. Press down, shaken together, running over, for by the standard of measure, it will be measured back to you in return. What's he saying? If you give a little, I'll make people give back to you a little. You give a lot, you'll get a lot. Now, I, this is one area, and this, again, this is one area that's so visible of all the areas of your spiritual life to see God move in. This is one that's the most visible way that you can see God move. It just becomes obvious and visible. You did something, keep your eyes open, see what God does. Well, I just don't think. Then don't be that religious hypocrite, all right? That is so arrogant and that is so self-exalting. Say, so, well, I just don't think. The Bible tells us to think. The Bible tells us to expect. The Bible tells us to live our life with expectation. We call it faith. I'm expecting God to move. God don't move, I'm sunk. God don't move, this church is sunk. And the way that we keep it moving and the way we keep moving forward is to be obedient to God. Trust God. See what God does. You'll, I mean, you start living this way with this expectation, you'll die when you die shouting. Amen. Because you saw God move and you experienced the grace of God. This is a promise from God. Remember, he who sows sparingly, reaps sparingly. You know, the Bible says, if you follow the scripture, that every good deed, everything, from a cup of cold water given in his name, he says, I'll reward you. God's that kind of God. Malachi makes it clear. I guess the big question is, do I believe that verse? Well, folks, if we don't, we might as well tear it out of the Bible. This is a true verse. And all this is simply saying, your giving determines what God's doing back in your life. You want God to do something large? Then you live large. Live big. Expect God to be big. I wonder, are you expecting God to do anything? Some of you are in a financial situation in your life right now. And the more you try to hold on to it, the worse your situation gets. There's healing available for you. But the only way for healing to come is for you to do what the Bible says to do. You get your finances in sync with your Heavenly Father and experience His grace in this regard. This is where He said, I want you to grow in this grace. I want you to have an expectancy from your Heavenly Father to meet your needs and to supply your, your needs. And so if I believe that, then I can be free to do what God desires me to do. There's two kinds of giving. One, there's the giving by reason. I can look at my wallet and say, and look at my checkbook and look at my investment and say, well, this is, this, this, is, this is really all I can do. I would like to do more, but the Bible says there's two ways to live your life, by the wisdom of the world or by the wisdom of God. First is the wisdom of God, the wisdom of the world. You know, I, 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 just, I need some stuff, so I, I don't want to give. Real giving is done by revelation. Revelation comes from the Word of God. Obviously, we talk about proportional giving. I believe there's giving beyond just a, a portion of a 10% or something. You know, I think there ought to be this earnestness in our heart like that of R.G. Letourneau, J.C. Penney, some of those men who said, I want to give bigger than that. You know, by the time I get to place, there ought to be a time where I'm giving 15%, then 20, then 25, that I can say, hey, God's honor me. But, but do you think you're going to live less by giving that more? No, God says when you give the more, he gives the more. Why? Because he's found somebody who has a heart that's right, who has a faith that's right, who has a commitment that's right, and who understands the world they live in. That you don't get blessed by things. You get blessed by God. So that we can give. That's why when you have the forward and faith thing, that we, you'll see a deal in your bulletin last Sunday, this Sunday, the next couple of Sundays. It, it's something we want you to give by revelation. You go spend time with God. I remember God told me one time, you got those pledge cards. Don't ever let people leave church with those cards in their hand. You make them fill them out right then and there. You know, it's kind of like put the pressure on, buy the car today. If you won't buy the car right now, I'm going to get the manager to see if he'll make you a better deal. That's not the way we live our lives. And that's not the way we respond to God. We go to God and we say, what would you have me do? Would you give me wisdom? He'll give us wisdom. He'll give us guidance. He'll give us understanding. 
And I believe God will speak to your heart. When I'm confused about some area of giving, I know what I've already committed to do in proportional giving, but these areas like missions and other stuff that I, that, I, that I want to participate in, you know, I ask the Lord. And if I'm not real sure, I, Kathy and I get together. So you go pray and I'll go pray and we'll see what God says. And you'd be surprised how many times we've come back with the exact same answer. God told me to do this. Well, God told me the same thing. Pressed my heart. God didn't tell me here. He tells me here. But then my spirit with my heart what I'm supposed to do. Can you live that kind of life? And do you think if you do live that kind of life that God's going to let you be suffering wants and needs and desperation in your life? No, God's going to meet the needs of your life. God doesn't ask you to do something that he doesn't tell you how to do it. And that's why in Scripture there's this great passage where Paul's talking about this particular offering for the Jerusalem church. He says, this, about the collection of, for, the, for the God's people of Jerusalem. Do what I told the Galatian church to do. What should I do? Here's how my giving auto operates. So on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. So seeing to it, saving it so that no, when I come, no collection will have to be made. In other words, you put aside what the Lord wants you to do. And he put it, it basically breaks down these three things. One, it ought to be regular. Whether my check comes monthly or bi-monthly or weekly, whatever, it ought to just be regular. In this regard, first day of the week, set aside. What's the second part, all right? It ought to be planned. It ought to be regular, it ought to be planned. It ought to be part of my budget. It ought to be the first line on my budget. You have a budget written out? First one ought to say, God. Amen? So much to the Lord. Third thing is, it ought to be proportional in keeping with his income. Some of you are still giving what you gave back when you made a little bit. You're making a lot more now, and you're still stuck back there. And that's not the way that you experience so much of the fullness that God has for you in your life. Summary, we just said the three points is to be responsible for what Christ has done for me in the past and how he loves me and how much he's given for me. It ought to be responsible for what God's doing for me right now. I just don't want to be living my life by selfishness and greed and covetousness and materialism, thinking that one more thing is going to make me happy. It's not. The third thing, it'll be responsible for what God will do for me. I'm expecting God to do something. And I can give big because God's going to respond to that. And I want you to know that's the kind of legacy we leave behind. Teaching that to your children, teaching that to your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren will forever transform their life. And they'll live without the worries and the stress and the depression and the despair that the culture we live in so much of the time experiences. The whole world, you know as well as I do, is freaking out. The economy globally, from the U.S. all the way on the other side of the globe to China and everything in between, is suffering. People are struggling. People are worried. People are fearful. What's going to happen to this? What's going to happen to the market? What's going to happen to... But those of you in this room who know these principles, you're not worried. You're not. It just might not make you happy. <laughs> but you're not worried. Because you believe God. You've put your money where your mouth is. And you've seen God do what he alone can do in our lives. Trust the Lord. Get in sync. Get this application of your life in sync. And this will be the message that will transform your life. To be honest with you, it was great, great. The greatest news of my life was getting saved and hearing about Jesus loved me. Didn't get any better than that. But the most important biblical principle I learned after that, how, what it meant to be saved, giving your life to Jesus, was taught to me probably within about a year, six months to a year, me being saved, about this. Someone said, you've got to learn how to give. It's a constant lesson. comes up every week, by the way. Amen? Amen. Let's stand with our heads bowed. We know what God's done for us, and we've seen the great...